at James Vaccaro, um, Executive Director of Climate Safe Lending Network. I was 22 years in, uh, in a bank, Triodos Bank, um, as uh, Director of Strategy. And so in terms of transition plans, putting together strategies and thinking about the components from lots of different levels, from the, from the leaves and the components, but really kind of going back down into where does it all come from? What's the source of that? That was, that was a primary um, role. Um, and whereas I sit on things like the Transition Plan Task Force, which is a UK government initiative and the GFAN's advisory panel, and they're putting out guidance on financial institution transition plans, I'm going to give a slightly more, um, uh, in a way, sort of roots and branch kind of uh, story uh, and, and offering. And in strategy, um, the whole of strategy um, is really looking at what happens in the internal environment, what's, the, what's going on within your trees, um, your internal pace of change and system, and what's really going on in the outside world. What are the elements that you are exposed to and in connection with? And it's being able to make sense of the space in between. Um, so my, my story is mostly going to be taking through the sort of the elements of the outside world and what is it that we can currently observe and how might that be impacting us at different um, levels. What I should also say is that, I mean, this story is as of today, it's a snapshot and the process of strategy and the process of transition plans ahead of us is going to be a constant cycle unless any of us are expecting our organizations to be static or expecting the world to be static that space in between the dilemmas the judgments the tensions are always going to be in flux so it's not just about being able to have a learning process of saying well did we do what we said we were going to do it's also being able to challenge at a more strategic level of is our picture of the world still the same? And if something has changed, do we need to think about what it is we need to do, how we bring ourselves to these new challenges? So if you go to the next slide, or maybe two slides, I'm going to take you through the elements. So the elements of uh, earth, water, fire, and air. Um, and this is maybe a little bit symbolic. But the earth is our sort of starting point. All life emanates from the soil. Um, from good soils, what are we in connection to? How are our roots currently in connection with that soil? Uh, our customers, our customer relationships, the connections we have to the societies we live in and the sectors we work with, the stakeholders, um, everywhere we're in. How do we, how do we conceive of those relationships? Are they currently nurturing us? Are, they, are we replenishing them and they are replenishing us in a regenerative cycle? Or is it extractive and transactional? Are we helping those relationships to bring us forward in, uh, in transitions? Um, or is there an element of, well, we need to, we need to be able to um, put it, you know, take products from the soil and put products into the soil, um, the more sort of conventional roots. Um, what are the daily conversations? I've said difficult daily conversations. They may, they may not be sort of difficult in the sort of the traditional sense of difficult and challenging, but like, how is it, what is the level of difficulty to have those really open conversations which bring us into deeper connection um, with all of the, you know, the soil of our, uh, of our connections to be able to really notice um, openly where are the synergies and tensions? Um, where are the things which may be uh, we need to look into a little bit more to keep on uncovering, turning over the soil to understand the nature of the challenges. That's always the birthplace of new ideas, of new, uh, of new um, strategies. How can we look within our own sort of soil um, in, in, in our organisation, looking at our change agenda? Um, things are changing and disrupting all the time within banking. What are the priorities and how are they set within our change agenda? How maybe are some of the priorities of sustainability being squeezed out from that? And maybe where are the synergies in being able to really integrate it? Maybe some of the, the hidden ways uh, of doing that. If we've got a lot of compliance and regulation and technology to do with, 
what might be the hidden sort of soil um, earth to kind of um, mobilize uh, and recruit to help us drive those sustainability transitions. Likewise, where is the talent in the organization that, you know, the, the greatest asset for any organization, but what is currently lying hidden or more likely latent and um, not being able to release its, its sort of uh, nutritional value for the rest of the organization to its optimum extent. Um, and that drive to make positive impact from people like you showing up here, all everyone trying to, to make a difference. Where are the, the, the points of resonance um, flowing through the, the, the networks in the, in the soil, the mycorrhizal networks underneath the soil give life to the forest, um, even when they're not seen. Um, and that resonance sort of uh, is what helps to really kind of create abundance in nature. But oftentimes there's blocked energy. Um, and that might be, you know, the blocking kind of impacts of very visible things, like people who have very different views about the integration of sustainability in finance. Um, you know, if you, if you have those types of the Stuart Kirk effect um, in every organization, then it might be that kind of visible block, or it might be much more subtle blocks, um, like just having to consistently do your monthly PL and being accountable for things which take away from that, that resonant energy. That's really from the internal um, uh, sort of soil, the earth perspective. Going on, Ali, to the next slide, if you take water. So water is all around flow um, and, and we are currently in, we're swimming in a vast ocean of, you know, the improved data monitoring and accounting and reporting and disclosure. There's more measurement capabilities and therefore more management possibilities than ever before. We have generated um, and we, the sort of the, people working especially in sustainability um, roles within banks, this torrent of information all around us. And it is potentially, um, it is potentially gonna be able to quench our thirst for a more conscious understanding to be able to, or it might be a flood of information, which potentially could even distract us or kind of overwhelm the senses in terms of what we're able to pay attention to. Um, an essayist, Duncan Austin, um, whose blog, Both Bain Brains Required, I can recommend highly recently said, um, well, gets measured, gets managed. It's a cute kind of management consultancy phrase, but actually when you really look at it, it might, doesn't always stand up to scrutiny. There's so much disclosure um, these days, which might be disclosed so that it isn't managed. It might even be a way of being able to um, put off being able to, to manage things. So how do we mobilize this kind of, this, this new ether, this flow of information around us to best serve our purposes? We don't have to just have information, we've got a sea of FinTech solutions, technology, new ideas, new approaches for pretty much every conceivable challenge. Being able to go through these rapid innovation processes and come up with, 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 uh, with new solutions, new, new um, uh, energy. Sustainability went from being sort of an identified one person's role to everyone's role. It's flowing through um, all, everyone in an organization. Is it everywhere, possibly everywhere and maybe nowhere at the same time? How do we make sense of that? Uh, in, in our internal roles. And in the outside world, um, the flow of information means that there's 360 degree comparison and scrutiny between organizations of organizations by NGOs who've got data capabilities way beyond uh, what existed a few years ago, ESG rating agencies, regulators, governments, league tables, measuring every aspect of climate, and biodiversity and human rights, diversity, everything being monitored 24 seven. Um, and that flow um, all around us can sometimes maybe be stultifying. It's sort of, well, do we want, how do we, how do we make sure that 
we don't fall foul of any of those regulations or standards, taxonomies, anti-greenwashing. Um, and what role might that play in being able to maybe hide some of those vulnerabilities? Um, so that's a little bit about the, the, the water uh, quality. And, and I think a challenge for the organization is, is if we are drowning, then who's controlling the tap for this? And what is it we're wanting from that flow? Turning to fire, um, so fire is always seen as kind of very dangerous uh, uh, element. Um, and there's a huge amount of dangers and risks, which are more and more tangible and readily realizable. The recognition of these encroaching tangible climate risks, whether it's floods, droughts, fires themselves, extreme heat, or the secondary order, second order sort of economic and social impacts that that causes. Climate is about hotter hots, colder colds, drier dries, and wetter wets. Um, and because everything is always in flux in, in life, what really matters is the extent to which it can break through those bounds of, of the, the boundaries which we can live within, and when does it kind of break through those? And fire has this wildness of quality, which is very difficult to contain. Um, and what we're seeing now is that um, the incidences of fires, for example, if we looked at the history of fires, there's always been fires, there's always been things like forest fires. But the incidence of 10,000 acre and above uh, fires over the last 40 years has gone up by 600%, seven times. So a one in a hundred year event is suddenly one in 15 years. That changes not just insurance premiums, that changes our entire psychology about, well, this is in our lifetime probably multiple times, certainly for our children. There's also the, the fire of anger of campaigners, youth activists, the critique and anger of what is happening. Um, and that will, that will again spark and be laid at the door of the finance industry as well as other uh, industries. Um, the, the, the famous Greta, Thunberg phrase of the world is on fire and all we hear is blah blah blah. We're about to go through another COP cycle uh, in only just over a week's time. How much are we really going to be expecting which is going to be effective extinguishment of that of that fire and what is it we can what is it we can bring? On the other hand, there's critique from the other side, the anti-ESG, some of the, the anti-woke, especially in the US, uh, backlash. For, for actually screening out any of the, the sustainability thinking in finance, because finance shouldn't involve any of this, this stuff. Um, almost the, the, the sheer framing of the needs to justify sustainability puts us already on a, on a back foot. And within that anger, and within that kind of challenge of what's being destroyed lies fire as the spark of creative innovation. Fire does create destruction. Um, there is real grief maybe for what is being destroyed. Um, the broken truths or the burnt um, hopes of is one and a half degrees still alive really? Um, what does that do? How, how do we help ourselves to move through that grief and from the embers of the fire create that spark of innovation um, to create those new solutions? It's a lot about rupture um, and how do we repair from the, these ruptures and move to, to build in the in the sort of the embers of that whilst the fire is taking place. Um, I have a student who's from Ukraine who is just thinking about the day that the war is over, like day one, what what is it that um, the plan for what it is to build? It's quite a lesson, um, uh, sort of a, a sobering lesson for, for, for everyone in the space. Next uh, slide, the final element is air. So what is it that we carry? How do we distribute the seeds? How do we all connect in this sort of the, the ether of um, air all around us as we're jointly planning, um, not just what we do individually, but how we collaborate and um, the voluntary alliances that are formed, um, the GFAN, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, SBTI, the Race to Zero, PCAF, all of these joint voluntary initiatives, which 
contain with them targets and sub-targets and lots of initiatives and commitments. They can come from that kind of good place of, well, how do we find one another um, in, in, the, in the different space to, to coalesce, to be able to share best practices, to come together like this, to network, to learn ideas, guidance, inspiration, mentorship, um, uh, being able to rely upon one another. Sometimes they fall short, um, however, uh, and, and they can sometimes be sort of seen as, well, is this just hot air? Is it just talk? Do they actually transpire into the things which are going to move things forward? How do we solidify these kind of more gaseous concepts? And how do we solidify some of these broader sustainability concepts? Things like the just transition, whole economy transition, nature positive, the SDGs, they're all things that we're aspiring to. And yet, like a will o' the wisp, it's hard to grasp them. It's hard to be able to translate it into, but what does that actually look like? next week, next month, next year, with our clients, with our stakeholders compared to how it's been before. And that brings into question the whole of the future role of banks and money. What is it we're doing here? Are banks just here to follow the money, uh, to provide allocation of capital? What's the role that we play beyond that in being advisors of being sounding boards, of being data aggregators, of sense makers, of network conveners, of relationship brokers, market shapers, policy influencers, all of those things which aren't necessarily in the business model, where you're not paid for that. And yet it might be the very fabric of what of what banks might be and being able to uh, to bring together these disparate elements um, which are floating around right now. Final slide for me goes into the, the world that we're living in and the, the, the vortex, the, the unstable landscape. Um, there is no snapshot. Uh, I'm in the UK. I feel almost, I feel like well, it's been 48 hours since we formed the last government. Surely we, we're due another one in another 48 hours. Um, there was a VUCA world, for some of you may have seen this, this uh, um, acronym, BANI, Brittle, Anxious, Nonlinear, Incomprehensive. Brittle, we've seen how brittle this year our supply chains are, um, the energy crisis and political instability, things break um, uh, and, and are very fragile. Um, so things which we expect to be continuous, really having those discontinuities that sets in play a real anxiety uh, at the moment as a consequence um, of energy crisis um, and inflation. There's huge amounts of financial vulnerability. Um, it's interesting going into COP27, how many of the emerging countries are saying it's like, oh, right, but you can't help us now from the West because you're suffering financial vulnerability. Well, in a broader context, that's been around for, for some time. And that's been constant, perpetual anxiety the threats to the future generations. We're recognizing now how those future generations are going to suffer. It is baked in the pie. And this constant media consumption just kind of keeps us kind of attenuated to, to anxiety and other people's anxiety in the world. There's a non-linearity. The way that things are brittle is that it's sudden shocks. There's this asymmetry of outcomes. It's when, when the flood goes beyond that, that kind of riverbank and flood the town. It may have just been an incremental change uh, in terms of water level, but it has a huge impact. And that's been amplifying things like uh, uh, inequalities. So it's being able to further uh, amplify some of these already um, uh, sort of known forces within, within society. And it feels incomprehensible for the most time. Um, we are in disconnection often from nature, from ourselves and a breakdown of community from understanding what is even true anymore, um, you know, in the sort of the era of post-truth and fake news. So all together, we can take slides down, I'll leave you with some of the, the dilemmas specifically for transition plans. As you think through some of the, the, the tangible strategies of how can we change pricing structures for sustainability linked loans? Um, and for those who've been following the ways in which they often 
get undermined by some of the, the behaviors to sort of talk about the good stuff. Um, for example, well, we've managed to make our, you know, we've, we've managed to meet all the commitments that a client signed up to without taking responsibility for the, for the much more vulnerable, difficult stuff like, well, maybe we did cherry pick the targets uh, and maybe they weren't so stretching and maybe there wasn't really um, a penalty in terms of uh, if they weren't being able to make it. How do we look at some of the supply chain uh, issues, even within the clean supply chains? It's like, well, there's always tensions. There are always dilemmas to resolve. Um, how do we make sense of that and keep looking even when it's difficult? How do we take on subjects like the just transition and really open ourselves up to the broad, um, the broad issues in, in society? It's not just about um, the consequences for people working in industries which are in, reaching a sunset. Um, you know, when you consider the communities in, in Pakistan in the last months or in other places hugely affected by, by physical risks of climate, we see that there is a, there is a massive joint um, issue in terms of how this, this, this transition and concepts of social justice are shared. And it's about how do we stay in relationship through engagements which are going to be difficult. Um, um, for any of you who are parents, it's, it can be challenging sometimes to really be able to enforce consequences, yet really maintain relationship. Um, it's, a, it's a fine line, it's a difficult dance that we have. And as we get into the tougher elements of transition, how are we readying ourselves for those kind of conversations? How do we stay in relationship whilst being able to really assert at a fundamental level the engagement that's required? And potentially that, like in the, in the, in the fire sense, leads to rupture. Maybe there are certain relationships which can't continue and that through going with that, there is a means to be able to repair, to be able to reconnect, recreate new relationships, which become uh, the new economy, our new reality. Um, difficult to put into, um, into a, a single plan, which is why we have to think about these as living, breathing uh, manifestations of how we want change to take place. That is my canter through um, the, the the sort of the external landscape, uh, and it's an offering. It's uh, it may have created personalised images for you, um, and uh, and hopefully has stimulated a few thoughts. It's uh, it's not my it's not my, what I would present usually as my normal kind of canter through the landscape of transition plans, but hopefully it's given some food for thought.